Greetings, church family. This is the 29th of October Sunday School lesson, and wow, we're, we're quickly approaching November. Can you believe that? Uh, I just heard on the news a little bit ago that there was a big cold snap coming, and there, were gonna be, there was going to be a really good chance of snow this year for much of the United States for Christmas and the holidays. Uh, but we're not even into uh, Halloween yet. That Halloween was actually my mother's birthday. October 31st was her actual birthday. And she went out for Halloween like nobody else I knew at that time. And probably qualifies me for some deep psychotherapy uh, because one of my earliest childhood memories uh, had to do with our grade school's masquerade party uh, for Halloween when my mom made a very clever uh, outfit from what are called milk filters from the dairy industry. They're a little larger than uh, coffee filters, big white fluffy things, frilly things. And she made a very pretty prom dress that she had me wear when I was probably seven years old. So I'm, I'm probably marked for life. But anyway, uh, I, thankfully, even then I was a pretty large kid. So I was able to uh, to, to defend myself from the school bullies who were mostly girls and they were mostly jealous because of the dress. They liked it, I think. In any case, uh, I think she really wanted a girl, but uh, after that disaster, she, she, I think she had to let go of that fantasy because I was not a happy camper. Anyway, but mom was a, she was a great mom. She's, she's why I'm a true believer today, I believe. Okay, with that crazy visual of me in a white prom dress, uh, anyway, just uh, turn your Bibles to the oldest book in the Bible. It's the book of Job, and we're going to settle in on chapter 30 and chapter 42, jump around a little bit in there too, but uh, those are the main primary passages. So while you're turning there, let's pray. Father God, thank you for for a beautiful day. It's just been so nice and so so the skies have been amazing. The temperature is great. With nothing to complain about, it's just been awesome. Thank you for that. Thank you for life. Thank you for health. Those that are watching today, some of them are struggling a little bit, and I pray that you'll just touch them in a very powerful way and and just remind them how much you love them and how much they are loved. I thank you, Father, for this lesson. I thank you for the Book of Job that. Uh, it, it has a lot more questions than answers sometimes, but it does point us in a, in a very good direction on how we should handle uh, suffering. And I, I pray, Lord, that you'll just give us a, an insight in, in, in this study. Help us, Father, to, to, to really understand what you want us to understand today. Guard my lips. Help me, Father, not to say anything that would, would not be pleasing to you today. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, uh, a lot of the world, and, and not just a few Christians, uh, wonder why bad things happen to good people. Uh, we don't seem to have an issue when bad things happen to evildoers. In fact, we kind of think we're, they're getting what they deserve. Uh, we might even struggle a little bit when uh, good things happen to evil people, but... Uh, Let's just take a look at our central character today, Job. Uh, we're going to get a concise bio of him, his first verse in, in Job 1, where it says this, There was a man in the land of Uz whose name was Job, and that man was blameless and upright and who feared God and shunned evil. And, and one who feared God and shunned evil. He was, he was pretty special. So we see this see this description. He was a good man, a righteous man, uh, who we learn in the next few verses was also very blessed. He had he had a lot of things. He was uh, he was a, a rich man, and if you recall from your v VBS or maybe from some Sunday school lesson along the way or some of your Bible reading, that you remember that uh, Satan basically went before God and defamed Job, saying that he's only righteous because you bless him so much. If you take his blessings away, he'll turn like a, he'll turn like old milk. Uh, but he didn't. Uh, he, a lot of bad things happened to him. Uh, it, again, he uh, during this time, Job's well, 
it's just awful. He lost his, his kids. He lost his fortune. His so-called friends came crawling out to, uh, to accuse Job of some terrible hidden sin in his life. Uh, because that was a pretty pervasive line of thought in, in that day. And I actually think it carries on today some, to some degree, uh, that when someone falls sick or they, or they have some terrible calamity, uh, it's a result of something, some failure in their life, some, some sin or some failure that they've done. And, and while that can certainly be the cause, uh, it, it's, I don't think it should be our first impulse especially when, when we have, when you're introspectively looking at yourself to examine your heart, to assure yourself that your relationship with Jesus is, is good. Uh, and, and Job, to the best of his knowledge, was not guilty of anything his, his friends accused him of. And, and that's when the struggle then went internal. He, he, he took it on himself internally. So let's begin with uh, the, some of Job's analysis of his uh, own, uh, of it. he was looking at himself and seeing what he, he saw about himself. Let's look in Job 30, verse 25 to 31, where he says, have I not wept for, have I not wept for him who was in trouble? Has not my soul grieved for the poor? But when when I looked for good, evil came to me, and when I waited for light, then came darkness. My heart is in turmoil and cannot rest. Days of affliction confront me. I go without. I go about mourning, but not in the sun. I stand up in the assembly and cry out for help. And I am a brother of jackals and a companion of ostriches. I've never understood that verse, and I, I guess I really need to look into it. But anyway. My skin grows black and falls from me. My bones turn with, or burn with fever. My, this is, listen to this verse. My harp is tuned to mourning and my flute to the voice of those who weep. Notice that Job uh, passed his own test for caring for his fellow man. Uh, and and I, I noticed, noticed the words, he wept and he grieved. Those are... Uh, those are private things, kind of. He, it doesn't say that he reached out and did anything, I, I, but I'm not going to go there today. I, I, don't, I don't think that's a tell, but uh, I noticed that his, it has to do with his feelings. Uh, and he's, So he's got the feelings for the poor and the troubled. Uh, so anyway, but, he, but I, I'm going to go out on a limb, but I, I, almost, I almost sense a, a tinge of pride in his uh, analysis of his life. He's almost saying, look at me, look at how I feel for those around me. Uh, I, I truly believe Job was, was really, indeed, was, he was really righteous. He was a good man. Uh, yet I've, I've taken a step back and I've asked, I've asked myself, as we all should, by whose standards was he judging his actions? By what standards do I judge my actions? In this passage, he goes from defending himself with those with comments about the poor and the, and the troubled. Uh, he goes from that, that, that analysis of his, uh, of his condition or his, uh, of his actions. Uh, he, then he goes into this description of his depression and it, it, he is indeed depressed. Uh, and he had good reason to be depressed. Let's think about that. His ki his children, his kids, they were grown, pretty much grown by now. His kids and his fortune are gone. They're de they're, they're they're gone. Uh, and his uh, even his friends seem to take pleasure in in uh, in goading him and trying to get him to confess to something he didn't do. And his wife. Uh, she, early on, I think it was the second chapter, she says, why don't you just curse God and die? So he's, he's pretty well reached the bottom of the well of depression, I, I, I think. There's a, there's, but there is a very important point we need to see in all this. Job, even though he certainly didn't understand why things were going as they did, he never stopped in his reaching up to God. He continued over and over again to reach out to God. Uh, and, and, but 
for the most part, for, uh, certainly for the vast majority of the time, he was asking why. Why was this happening? Uh, but, but once he came to an end of himself, he simply acknowledged that he needed God. I see someone in this passage whose heart song had, had gone from almost carefree when he was prosperous to someone whose, whose uh, heart song had turned to mourning and sorrow. Uh, it, it, it would be like a funeral dirge that he would be hearing in his heart, his mind's uh, ear, if you will. Well, let's move ahead in uh, Job 42. Uh, it says, then Job answered the Lord. Well, what does that mean? It means God talked to him. We'll talk about that in a minute. But then Job, Job answered the Lord and said, I know that you can do everything and that no purpose of yours can be withheld from us. In other words, what you want to do, you can do. You ask, who is this who hides counsel without knowledge? Therefore, I have uttered what I did not understand, things too wonderful for me, which I did not know. Don't miss this. This is, I think this is important. God has taken his time to speak to Job. There's not a specific answer here that Job is seeking. He's, he's hearing God's answer to him, and it's not perhaps what he really wanted to hear, but it's almost like God is saying, Job, you're asking the wrong question. In, in God's response to, uh, in Job 41, God is laying out a simple, but I think very huge truth that's, that's found in uh, verse 33a, the first part of 33, in chapter 41, where it says, on earth there is nothing like him. Oh, duh. He, he gets it. He, he finally understands. God had spent 34 vo uh, verses of poetry uh, in chapter 41 to exclaim that central truth, that there is no one like God. Uh, and and the tr that truth is something we all need to, uh, to prepare us, I think, for life, for dying, and for death, those three phases of our life. Uh, we, we must come to the place where we see God as he is so we, we can see ourselves as he sees us. I, th I think Job, uh, like many of you, or even most of us, actually have a pretty high opinion. Uh, he had a high opinion of himself at least early on. In Job, in the Job 42, verse one to three passage, we see Job coming to grips with his own humanity as compared with God's deity. He was seeing how, how majestic God was and how, how pitiful, frankly, he was. Uh, look at verse three again. It says, who is this who hides counsel without knowledge? Therefore, I, Job, have uttered what I did not understand, things too wonderful for me, which I did not know. This response comes from after God says something to him, and, and I, again, I see him getting, giving himself a, what we call a gib slap around here. I, I, he got it. Uh, in ver, uh, chapter 38, verses 1 to 3, God says this, then the Lord answered Job out of the whirlwind and said, Who is this who darkens counsel by, by words without knowledge? Who prepare your, Now prepare yourself like a man. I will question you and you shall answer me. Uh, it's a pretty tough passage, and, but I, I want to give you my paraphrase of this. <laughs> Just who do you think you are, Job? Suck it up, buttercup. <laughs> and listen... Pay attention while I, God, speak. While I, God, ask the questions, then you can answer. So let's, let's finish up now in Job 42. We're going to move on down to verses 4 to 6, where I really do think Job got it. He said, listen, please, and let me speak. You, and his, Job is begging God to, to hear, his, hear him, what he said, has to say. You said, I will question you and you shall answer me. I have heard of you by the hearing of the ear, but now my eye sees you. I, I see you as you are. Therefore, I see you as you are. Therefore, I, ab I abhor myself. I can't stand myself. And, and, re and I repent in dust and ashes. Job gets it. 
he, this, this is so much less about Job than it is completely about God's presence in Job's situation. Job says, I see you. Now, now I see myself and I repent. That's, that's my translation of what he just says. So, so how does this answer the question, why do we suffer? Well, I believe we should try to change our focus. Uh, I do anyway. We should change our focus entirely. Uh, when we're going through life's terrible situations, first of all, it's perfectly normal and acceptable to ask questions. It's he, God's shoulders are broad. He can un, he can handle the whys and the and the why nots and the you know those questions. He can handle those. We just shouldn't panic or or get frustrated when we don't get the answers that we're asking. Uh, the, the answers we really want to see, actually, we, you know, we have a pre, we have, we have an answer we want to hear, and that's what we're listening for. And and God usually doesn't answer the way we think He's going to. I, I, you know, there are questions I still have. Uh, why would a drunk driver crash into my brother-in-law's car at eleven thirty in the morning, killing him? You know, I, I, I don't understand that. Why would one of my dearest friends around here uh, go in for a routine test and, oh, and and die from a reaction, an allergic reaction to the media, the contrasting media that they were using in her in her test? Why, why, why? We ask those questions, but the reality is, I think Jesus clearly stated it in Matthew five forty five, where he says that you may be sons of your father in heaven, for he makes his son rise on the evil and on the good and sends rain on the just and on the unjust. What does that sim simply say? Life happens, good and bad. Uh, <laughs> we seem to ask way more questions about the bad while we kind of take for granted the good stuff. We, uh, we, we're happy about that. We don't, we don't even usually uh, say thank you for anything. Most of the times we neglect saying any kind of praise for what good things that happened to us. Uh, but more importantly, we need to praise him for being there with us when we go through bad times. See, that's what Job had to come to. He had to get to the place where he was saying, oh, I see myself as you see me. I'm sorry, I repent, was what he says. And when he did that, well, the lights went on. Everything was good for him. Uh, I, I need to praise him more, even in the bad times. I, because I think the bad times uh, should cause us to be more grateful for the good things that, that he does. Well, I would uh, conclude with something that Paul wrote to his favorite church in in. Philippi. It's Philippians 4 verses 10 to 13. But I rejoiced in the Lord greatly that now at last your care for me has flourished again. Though you surely did care, you lacked opportunity. But not that I speak in regard to need, for I have learned, and now this is the key, that rest of that was he's just saying, don't worry that you didn't get me a love offering. You didn't know about it. He said, but here he says, not that I, let's see, for, Here's the key. For I have learned in whatever state I am, North Carolina, South Carolina, even Minnesota, whatever state I'm in, I know how to be abased. First of all, I know how to be content. I know how to be abased and I know how to abound. Everywhere and in all things, I have learned both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. And then he says that magnificent passage where he says, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Now, it's hard for us to remember that Paul was probably chained between guards when he wrote this. This is one of the prison epistles. Uh, he, he was in, it, it, I, was, I visited the maritime uh, uh, prison in, in Rome, and it was basically a hole about the size of this room and it was a circular hole that you, you no stairs to get out. And it was, uh, I'm sure there was no toilet facilities there. I don't know how they handle it. don't want to know. Uh, I don't want to know how they ate, what they ate. I just know it was awful. 
and he was in there and he wrote those words where he says, I know how to abound and I know how to be abased and I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me while he was chained between guards. Mm. Uh, the thing is, we need to learn to be, uh, to have lives of gratitude even when we're less than comfortable. When I take that attitude, when you take that attitude, uh, you, you can indeed do all things through Christ who strengthens you, even in chains. Sufferings should drive us to our knees, literally, to seek answers. But even when those answers are elusive, we should seek God's very real presence in, in, those, in those sufferings, in those times of suffering. It's, I think that the, 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 the book of Job, uh, though I have a lot of questions about it, but I, I still scratch my head about some of the stuff that, that happened in that book, some of the things I've read. But the reality is Job was troubled until he saw God as he is and he saw himself as he is. Once he did that, his, uh, his, his redemption then could, could happen. Uh, he didn't cur curse God. Even when he was angry with God, uh, he asked questions. He kept asking questions. Uh, the, the reality is, as a sufferer, you have the right to ask, but you also have the right to say, now what, Lord? What would you like for me to learn from this? That's, that's why sometimes we suffer. So we, so we can learn to be grateful for the good things, so we can learn to go strongly into his loving arms, we can, we can learn to pray. There's a lot of things we can learn during times of suffering that we don't seem to do too well at when things are going well. Well, uh, Tuesday, next Tuesday, is our annual trip, trunk or treat outreach at church. And I ask you to, to fervently pray for that. There's, there, we've had estimates from 600 to 1,000 kids that will be coming through for candy and tracts and Bibles and hugs and uh, maybe the first time they've ever experienced a loving church. So pray for that and pray for the those volunteers that are gonna be doing stuff. If you haven't had a chance to supply some candy, they could use that, I'm sure. But just pray for that outreach because that is a major outreach of our church. So let's pray. Lord, thank you for today. Thank you for life, for even the struggles of life that cause us to, to lean into you. I pray, Lord, that you would give us less lessons from the book of Job, that you would show us uh, what we really need to understand there, that we need you, that we, we desperately need your touch, even when we don't understand, and help us to trust you when we don't understand. Now, Lord, I pray for our ser the services to follow, that you would bless the, the, all the activities, all the, the Sunday school, the, the, the music, the offering, the announcements, and especially, Father, the, 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 the sermon and the, and the altar call to follow. I pray that your, your will would be done, that people would come flocking to find out more about you. Lord, we love you. We thank you for what you're going to do. And be with those, Father, who are hurting right now, the, uh, the, the folks who are recovering from illness. The, uh, there's so much need. I just lift them up to you now and ask that you touch them in a very special way. Thank you for all you do, for all you're going to do. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, next week, we're going to take a look at 1 John chapter 5, where we're going to explore that question, surely. This is not true. Is Jesus the only way to God? And we're going to get an answer for that from the scriptures. Be sure to subscribe, like, and share, and uh, particularly the, share the lesson with uh, those maybe on Facebook that you're friends with. Pray that, uh, that someone would uh, find something they need today in this. If you have any questions or comments or needs, I, I wish you would call the church office at 843-236-2224 uh, and, and let somebody know because a lot of times we don't know and, and I'm speaking now as a deacon 
I would ask you to let us know so we can reach out and do what we can for you. We love you guys. Have a blessed, blessed weekend. Bye-bye.